Okay, so now please give us a moment or two while the next speaker connects their slides. Okay, Eugene, are you, are you ready? Yeah, can you hear me? And yes, I can hear you loud and clear. That's great. great. Thank um, you. So um, I'm very pleased to welcome the, the final speaker of this session, Eugene Tang from Caltech, who's going to speak on the ghost in the radiation, robust encodings of the black hole interior. And the, the moderator assisting me with the questions for this talk is Carlos Paracciari. Over to you, Eugene. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about black holes and how to study them information theoretically. And I know it's not a usual topic for QIP, so it's going to be, the talk's going to be a little bit front heavy with a lot of introduction so that everyone gets up to speed with exactly what the problem is and exactly what it's being taken to solve the problem. And um, so let's talk about the entanglement structure of black hole evaporation first. So a very simple model for black hole evaporation is based on this heuristic pair creation picture for Hawking radiation. So we begin with some pure state, which represents the state of the black hole, perhaps just before formation or just after formation, before any actual dynamics has really taken place. And we model time evolution through this induced pair creation process. And schematically, what the evolution does is it modifies the matter state slightly, but not very much because the evaporation process takes place at the event horizon region away from the singularity. But what's important is that we model the escape of Hawking radiation through appending EPR pairs, essentially. And so at every time step, we're going to have some outgoing mode that we label B, which is maximally entangled with some partner mode that we label as B tilde. And so this you can imagine as just one step of the black hole evaporation process. And the entire black hole evaporation process takes place over many, many time steps. So after n time steps, we might imagine that the overall state is given just by appending n pairs of these black hole um, EPR pairs consisting of outgoing radiation and interior partnered modes. So this immediately gives us a problem called the traditional black hole information problem, which is that if we trace away the interior of the black hole, the interior modes B tilde, then the exterior modes are left in the maximally mixed state. And this corresponds to the usual statement uh, that Hawking radiation is completely thermal. So this was the original problem that um, Hawking discovered in the 1970s. And this seems to be problematic in the sense that there is tension between this process and the unitarity of quantum evolution. Meaning that by assumption, we started with some pure state and we are left in the end, at the end of the process of black hole evaporation with a mixed state. And this is really um, a statement about the asymptotic evolution of black holes, about the S matrix in terms of um, particle scattering, if you will. We start with some pure state in the beginning, and we are left with some mixed state at the very end. You can sort of sharpen this in modern terms to finite times using entanglement entropies. And this becomes the so-called modern firewall problem. And that's the problem that we are going to try and address today. So what happens now is that let's consider this process and let's consider some late mode, which is labeled by some uh, large integer k. So we're gonna siphon, we're gonna kind of sector off all of the early radiation, the modes emitted before this mode k as E which stands for the early radiation. And so we have some late outgoing mode B, which is maximally entangled with its partner mode behind the event horizon. So a few things must happen that we know from quantum field theory and also from our toy, uh, toy model before. The first is that the outgoing mode should be maximally entangled with its partner mode behind the horizon. And in sort of field theory terms, this really signifies the fact that the event horizon is not a very special place in terms of general relativity. It's just some smooth parts of space-time. And so you can think of this relation signifying purity as signifying the smoothness of space-time of the, of the, uh, space near the event horizon. The second thing that must happen if the entire dynamics is to remain unitary is that if you start with a pure state, you must end with a pure state. 
So at some point in time, the outgoing modes must start to purify the early radiation. Otherwise, there's no way for the radiation to end up being pure. And so the unitarity of time dynamics gives the second relation on the entropies, which is that the collective state at some late time must be more pure than the early radiation by itself. So altogether, we essentially have three conditions. So the first one is just strong stabilitivity, which comes from the mathematics of entanglement entropies. The second comes from purity, which signifies the fact that the event horizon is smooth. And the last one signifies the fact that late radiation must purify early radiation. And this kind of uh, comes from the unitarity of time dynamics. And the black hole firewall problem states that these three conditions, all of which are very well established in their own domains of validity, are mutually contradictory. So just stepping through some algebra here, using strong subjectivity, using the smoothness of the horizon, and then finally using the unitary of time evolution, we draw just very basic inequalities following from these uh, three encoded states, that you get a contradiction in the end that the entropy of the outgoing mode must be strictly negative, which contradicts the fact that um, we expect entropies to be positive. And so this inconsistency in the entanglement structure is what's called the black hole firewall problem. And the reason why it's named as the firewall problem is that the original authors of this paradox supposed that the blue condition was the one that was most likely to be untrue. So if you violate the blue condition, you're saying that it's no longer true that the event horizon is smooth because that's what the blue condition signifies. But instead, there has to be some structure there caused from the breaking of entanglement between the radiation and its interior partners. And this manifests itself as something which is called the firewall. So immediately after this problem was proposed, there was numerous solutions, um, each with its own merits and flaws. We're gonna focus on one particular proposal which has gained a lot of traction in recent years due to various reasons. And uh, it goes under various different names. Some call it um, some variations of ER equals EPR, entangled islands, and so on and so forth. But we're just gonna call it the B tilde and E proposal. And to understand this proposal, you kind of have to trace back what the underlying problem of the firewall paradox is. And the underlying problem distilled into sort of a one sentence statement is the fact that any outgoing mode has to be entangled with two things. It has to be entangled both with the interior partner B tilde, as well as the early radiation. And this ends up being a violation of monogamy of entanglement. So if monogamy is the fundamental problem, then the simplest solution is to identify the two problematic subsystems to somehow embed the interior partner mode B, tilde, within the exterior radiation somehow, so that these two systems, which violate monogamy, are identified. This is sort of a very naive, simple statement, and it's not really clear what it really means, and it causes just as many problems as it solves just by the simple statement here. For example, if the interior is actually embedded within the exterior, what does that mean for the causal structure of the black hole space-time? How can you possibly preserve locality with such an embedding? Because this is fundamentally not local. Relatedly, how do you protect the interior degrees of freedom from the outside observers? Is it possible for some outside observer really far away from the black hole to interact with the early radiation? And because you expect the interior to be embedded within the exterior radiation to now signal into the interior, which is ostensibly space-like separated, causing violations of causality. And what does this all mean in the first place? How can such an embedding be realized in practice? What are the underlying mechanisms that allow for this to happen? So this sounds sort of really crazy at first glance, and um, but there, there's, a ton of recent evidence that really suggests that something akin to this proposal is really what happens. And most of the evidence comes from uh, holography and ADS-CFT, but here we want to look at it in a purely information theoretic term. So the remainder of the talk is going to explain exactly what uh, we do to try and address this proposal, make it concrete, and solve the problems that were introduced.
So the first thing we're going to do is that we're going to postulate that black holes are very efficient scramblers. And this is something which is very common in the literature, but we're going to put a spin on it. Namely, that we're going to assume that the exterior Hawking radiation is in a very special state called a computationally pseudorandom state. And I'll explain exactly what I mean by this in a little bit. So through this hypothesis, we show that every black hole defines a very natural encoding of each interior mode into the exterior Hawking radiation. And moreover, that such an encoding forms an error correcting code, which protects against all operations that some observer with limited computational capability can perform. And so the final takeaway of all of this is that if you have a sufficiently powerful observer, they can in principle detect violations of causality and locality under this proposal, but only provided they're able to perform operations which are of exponential complexity in the entropy of the remaining black hole. And we're gonna argue that this is essentially unphysical. So to proceed further, we need to introduce exactly what we mean by pseudorandomness. So let's say that a state uh, row is computationally pseudorandom if for all polynomial time algorithms A, so sigma here denotes the maximum mixed state, that for any polynomial time algorithm, the probability of accepting rho is essentially indistinguishable up to some error, which is typically taken to be exponentially suppressed in the system size, that, um, that this state is essentially indistinguishable from the perspective of polynomial time algorithms for these states against the maximum mixed state. And a priori, it's not very clear that pseudorandom states even exist, but they actually exist in great abundance. For example, if you take a, uh, a random state sample from the Haar measure with um, overwhelming probability, that state will be pseudorandom just by virtue of the fact that most states have exponential circuit complexity of preparation. But we sort of need a bit more. We need states that are both computationally pseudorandom and can be efficiently prepared. And assuming standard cryptographic primitives, you can show that these states exist and can be efficiently prepared. So this comes from a paper, uh, a recent paper by Ji Liu and Song, which is um, under this archive number right here. So how does this connect with black holes? This ultimately goes back to an older paper of Harlow and Hayden's, which argues that any experiment which can witness this firewall paradox, witness this discrepancy of entanglement structure, must be exponentially complex. And they argue that the takeaway from this is that exponentially complex operations should really be taken as unphysical. That a physical theory should come with not just restrictions to low energies, as we expect from effective theories, but really also to low complexities. And so we should take a statement like Hawking radiation appears thermal, which is in contradiction with the unitarity of quantum mechanics. And we should give an operational meaning to this statement. And that's something we're quite used to as information theorists. So instead of saying that Hawking radiation appears thermal, we should modify the statement into saying that Hawking radiation appears thermal, but only to physically realistic observers. That is to computationally bounded observers. And this is essentially the pseudorandomness condition right here. And the remainder of this work essentially explores what happens if you take this statement very seriously and adopt it as your starting point. So the overall setup is going to be as follows. So this is a space-time circuit diagram with time always running upwards. So we start with some pure state of the matter, and then we let U of BH denote the black hole formation and evaporation unitary. So everything is going to be manifestly unitary in our setup. So at some late time t, we're going to separate the system into a bunch of parts. So h here denotes the remainder of the black hole, which has not yet evaporated. b denotes some late outgoing modes. So for simplicity, this will be some constant size system, and uh, we can take it to be basically one qubit without loss of generality. And e will denote all of the early Hawking radiation that has been emitted um, before this point. And the dynamics of the unitary are not going to be very important for us aside from the pseudorandomness hypothesis. So we're just gonna denote this state by some state psi. So psi of EBH from now on will always denote the pure state of the black hole 
together with all of its radiation. We also want to introduce some kind of adversary, some kind of observable uh, observer, which is allowed to interact with the early radiation. And so we're going to introduce some ancillary system O, which is again allowed to interact unitarily with the early radiation. And so the only restrictions we place is that O should have limited memory and size, which we fix to be smaller than the remaining black hole, and that the operations that O is allowed to apply onto E should be of polynomial complexity uh, in the entropy of the remaining black hole. So this is the physical setup we have. We have some observer which is allowed to physically interact with the early radiation, and we want to explore what exactly this observer can learn and do to uh, the black hole under this uh, B tilde and E proposal. So the fundamental definition and setup we have is the translation of pseudorandomness into our black hole setup. So psi of EBH denotes the state of the black hole and all of its radiation. And sigma again denotes the maximally mixed state. And so we say that our black hole state is pseudorandom on the radiation if there exists some constant alpha, doesn't really matter what the size of it is, such that for any two outcome measurement m with complexity polynomial in h, that our black hole state restricted to the external radiation is indistinguishable from the maximally mixed state up to this exponential error qualified in the entropy of the remaining black hole. And so this is really, this definition for us is really, as I said before, the axiomization of the thermality of Hawking radiation when you restrict to low complexity observers. And so we're always going to be assuming that equation 14 holds uh, from now on. And we're going to deduce all our consequences by assuming that black holes are pseudorandom. So the implications of this hypothesis are as follows. So we can show that there exists an encoding, V, that takes some interior mode and embeds it into the Hilbert space of the exterior radiation. Technically, the exterior radiation together with the Hilbert space of the remaining black hole. Moreover, that this encoding defines a quantum error correcting code, which we call the black hole code. This black hole code is extremely powerful in the sense that it protects against all operations which are performed by a computationally bad observer. So if you translate into the language of noise and channels, this code corrects against all channels whose purification is of sufficiently low complexity. So all channels of sufficiently low complexity and Krauss rank. This is our operational limitation for what the observer, observable uh, observer is allowed to do on the early radiation. And moreover, you can translate all of this into an algebraic statement, that there exists a complete set of logical operators that we call the ghost operators, which will commute with all of the correctable errors of the code. And these ghost operators you can show will serve as a witness to the fact that the final black hole, uh, black hole state still has smoothness of the horizon and preservation of causality. And this is a rather interesting statement here because it ends up um, not quite useful for black holes, but this ends up being equivalent to the correctability of a code. So this appears to be a new um, if and only if condition for the correctability of a code, which may be useful for other um, quantum information processing tasks and appears to be new in the literature as well. So I'll just sketch through a bit of the, um, of the proofs of these statements. And with all of the information theoretic um, studies of black holes, ultimately the key idea is to always prove some kind of decoupling bound. And our decoupling bound follows very easily from our pseudorandomness hypothesis. So let's suppose that we have our big state rho here which denotes the overall state of our observer together with the pure state of our black hole and all of its radiation. And then we trace away the early radiation and we trace away the remaining black hole. And the claim is that the remaining systems O and B are decoupled from each other up to some exponentially suppressed accuracy. And the way to see this is to note that if I perform any two outcome measurement on this state, 
by the Sewell-Remnitz hypothesis, I can effectively replace the state psi by the maximum mixed state. And in the maximum mixed state here on the right-hand side, B and O are by construction decoupled. So this equation holds for any polynomial size um, two outcome measurement. So we can take them to be all Pauli strings, for example. And if this holds for all Pauli strings, you can easily show that this ends up becoming a bound in the trace distance. So once you have this decoupling bound, so this decoupling bound is already saying that any external observer is not really able to interact with late emitted photons uh, of, the, of the Hawking radiation. And it allows us to- You have about five minutes left. Okay, sure, no problem. And what this decoupling bound really shows is that um, there's a very natural code subspace which is associated with this black hole. So I can take my black hole state and essentially purify the subsystem B. And you can show that this defines a unitary, uh, an isometric embedding that goes from some interior partner into the exterior radiation EH. So let me just, um, and this defines the code subspace that we call the black hole encoding. So you can quantify exactly what this code does. I'll just skip this in the interest of time. If you're interested in details, we can proceed in the round table. But the final step is to recast these into an algebraic form. So from quantum field theory, you kind of expect space-like separated operations to commute. And this is saying that any operation that someone can apply onto the interior mode should commute with any operation that some observer acting on the exterior radiation can apply. And this is this commutation condition here. And we expect this condition to hold as well when restricted to our code subspace, which translates into this equation 24 here. What this condition says is that we really expect to be able to find lots and lots of logical operators for our code that commutes with any operation that is correctable for the code. And any such logical operator we call a ghost operator. So a ghost, a ghost operator is any logical operator that commutes with all of the noise uh, operators for a correctable channel, essentially. And you can show that there exists a complete set of um, these ghost logical operators that satisfies these two relations. And essentially these two relations basically serve as um, a witness to the smoothness of the horizon and uh, a witness to the, um, to the locality of the black hole space-time through microcausality. And that's basically it. So we um, examine some proposal for the black hole firewall problem. We show that under a reasonable pseudo random hypothesis that we can find natural error correcting codes and that um, this proposal essentially leads to a very nice understanding of locality and causality for black holes. Thanks very much, Eugene. Um, so I can see that some people are starting to type questions. Um, but before, before they do, Carlo, do you have a question? Yes, of course. Uh, hi, Dan, and hi, Eugene. Thanks a lot for yeah. the great talk. Um, so I was wondering a bit about this uh, uh, assumption of a uh, pseudo randomness. Um, so I think you uh, justified well, for one side by linking to the fact that uh, radiation looks thermal for low complexity observer. Are there other hints, uh, let's say from uh, from gravity, um, that tell us that actually the this radiation should uh, should be pseudo random? Yeah, there is sort of a a folklore result uh, for black holes that basically black holes should be maximally chaotic. And there's like many different ways to quantify this. And normally it's saying that black holes are very well modeled by Haar random or you know, unitaries chosen from some design. But one sort of philosophical um, conclusion of this is that any quantum information task which is capable of being performed that black holes should essentially be up to that task. So if pseudo random states can be efficiently prepared, then we should really expect the generic black hole to be able to prepare them in a pseudo random state. Makes sense, thanks a lot. Thanks Eugene. So there's a question from Jonathan Shi um, in, the, in the Slack channel who asks, 
if the exponential complexity and black hole size of finding causality violations is the resolution to the firewall paradox, would that suggest the possibility of finding causality violations by observing small enough black holes? That I think would be the conclusion. So we don't really understand the regime of exactly what happens in. So the, the takeaway from this, I think, is really that this problem is operationally resolved for, com for operations that have sufficiently low complexity. And these are really the operations that we sort of have intuition for on a day-to-day -day basis. In the regime where you're able to perform extremely complicated computations, it seems that you really are able to witness violations of causality and um, locality. And this essentially comes from the fact that you still have a firewall paradox. But another way to think about this is that we just really don't understand exactly what happens in these regimes. It could be that this proposal really breaks down. It could really be that you do witness uh, violations of causality. It could also be that some other mechanism kicks in and protects it. So the most I can say right now is that we really don't know what happens in those regimes. Thanks, Eugene. Carlo, are there any more questions now in the Slack channel? Yes, there are. Um, we have one from Robert Garisto. Um, he says, this might be a naive question, uh, but how can the mode tilde B created at late time be entangled with E, given that E was emitted much earlier? I mean, this is really the, the crux of the information problem. So the fact that it has to be entangled with the early radiation, you can really think of just as a consequence of unitarity. So we know the early radiation is emitted in essentially a maximally mixed state. And we know that the end states can't be maximally mixed. So at some point, the radiation that's being emitted has to start purifying the early radiation, meaning that it has to start becoming entangled with the early radiation. And so this is a conclusion you basically find just from early dynamics of black holes together with the conclusion that you should end up after unitarity with a pure state. As for exactly how it happens, well, that's basically the crux of all of the study that goes into black holes. And I think the exact mechanism for kind of finite time dynamics of black holes is really not well understood at this point. So we still have time for a few more questions. So here's, a, here's another question from the Slack um, channel from Alexander Meeson. So thanks for that great talk. Um, you talk about ghost operators, and I'm wondering, are these connected to ghost fields, such as FADEF pop-off ghosts in quantum gauge field theories that are used to regularize a path integral? As far as we know, uh, no, they're not connected to FADEF pop-off ghosts at all. They just happen to share a name. So we call them ghost operators just um, by virtue of the fact that they're essentially undetectable to an external observer. So they appear to be ghosts that kind of live in the radiation and protect the mechanism of the black hole, but um, not quite related to fatty of pop-up ghosts besides sharing the name. Thanks, Eugene. So maybe one more question from, from me. So it's, 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 it's very um, interesting, this, this idea to think of um, this black hole process as representing quantum error correction. And I guess in quantum error correction, we, in standard quantum error correction, a very important role is played by the, the measurement to, to learn the, the syndrome. So, so in this case, what, what's doing the measurement or, or is that the wrong way of thinking about this? Well, we, we kind of roll all measurements into the channel itself. So basically you can think of it as any measurement you want to perform as being some instantiation of the channel that the observer can interact with the radiation with. And um, in the end, it's basically, as long as the overall operation, you know, as long as your measurements in the end are still polynomial complexity, that all of the conclusions should still really hold. So this channel is the channel between the black hole and the observer? It's, you can, you can think of it as um, the channel that um, results from any interaction of the observer acting on the radiation. So tracing out the observer, if you will. So thanks, thanks very much, Eugene. We're, we're out of time, but thanks very much for that, for that excellent talk. And um, let's thank all of the speakers from this session. And thank you, Carlo, for assisting me moderating this final talk.
So now that this um, session wraps up, and I would encourage you all to log on to one of the roundtable Zoom rooms. Uh, the link, as I'm sure you've worked out by now, is in the PDF, which you can access by clicking on the roundtable button immediately below the, the, the talk. So um, that's all for me. Thanks very much for attending this session.